Jesus is our rock. Uh, in uh, Psalm chapter 86 and verse 8, David wrote this, There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. So let's give praise to the Lord this morning as we sing, There is none like you. Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, at this time, Jessica has a special number for us called Because He Lives, and then after that, Pastor Matt will come with this morning's message. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future And life is worth the living just because he lives How sweet to hold our newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance 
This child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future And life is worth the living just because he lives And then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. Aren't you glad he lives? Amen. All because of him. I'm so very thankful for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God in the flesh who made Himself manifest. Amen. The title of this morning's message is called The Second Sabbath. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter number 6. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 6, The Second Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord, we are so very thankful that we have this privilege to gather in Your house. We pray, Lord, once again that You would just continue to be with us here as we worship You in spirit and truth this morning. Lord, help us to learn those things that You have for us. Draw us close to Your side. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter number 6. And it's all because of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. Because He lives, Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, God in the flesh, as John 1, 1 reminds us. Amen? And we take a look here at Luke chapter number 6, and we see this interaction that uh, Jesus is having with uh, scores of people that are here. And I don't want you guys in the back to, to get uncomfortable or anything, but I'm going to preach from Luke chapter 5 for a moment before I move into Luke chapter number 6. And just to bring us up to speed and and uh, the context of what's happening here. Luke chapter number 5, we're reminded of this time where Jesus meets with the disciples. I'm going to read Luke chapter 5 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now you remember that uh, the disciples had previously been out fishing, um, there wasn't, it wasn't a good night of fishing, if you will. I don't know if you've been fishing before and what a good night uh, means to you, but these fishermen did not think they had a good night uh, fishing, and they were actually wrapping things up. Uh, they were done for the night. And Jesus comes on the scene after uh, teaching here for a little bit out of the ship, and uh, he, uh, he asked them to launch out into the deep and let their nets down. Verse number 5, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. 
And this is amazing in itself. As I read the scripture and I see the disciples here as they're uh, beginning to follow Jesus Christ in his uh, ministry here, they're just uh, beginning to learn more and more about him. And uh, Simon here, he obeys what God tells him to do, doesn't he? God tells him to go ahead and do it. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been down to uh, Newport Beach or, or maybe even Long Beach, some of these places where the fishermen um, uh, bring their catches to the, to the fish market in the mornings. If you go down in Newport, they actually will uh, drive their uh, little boats that they have, and I can't believe they take these things out into the sea. They're not very big at all. They drive them right up onto the, the sand there in Newport, and they, they have a little makeshift fish market with fresh fish that they set up. And, you know, they do toil all night. They go out quite early in the morning. They're, they're out there. Uh, they're back early in the morning for the market to end up. And you look at the, the hard work that must have been put in by the disciples as they uh, were there uh, trying to catch some fish, and there was nothing there. And these are professional fishermen, aren't they? They know what's going on. I've been on a few deep sea, deep sea expeditions um, out here in Southern California, and typically the captains and those that are the true fishermen, they know what's going on. They know where the fish are and whether they're biting and whether they've moved on for the day and whatnot. And they've got a great knowledge of the sea and all that lives there within uh, to a certain extent. And yet Simon, as he receives a direction from Jesus Christ to go and launch out in spite of him thinking that he knows all these things, he just went ahead and followed, didn't he? And he goes out there and the Bible says in verse number um, I'm sorry here, let me get caught back up in the right verse. In verse number uh, 6 of Luke 5, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship, and they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. This sounds like a very successful fishing operation going on right here, doesn't it? These fishermen that they thought they knew everything, boy, they, they caught nothing all night long. And yet Jesus says, now nah, get out there, get those nets back out there. And they feel two ships full of fish to the place where they're sinking. Now, I've been on quite a few uh, charter boats out in the ocean, and I have never been on a boat that's been close to sinking because of the catch that was made that day. Never. And they've got great tanks. They, normally you catch your fish and you throw them in a, in, in a tank there that, that keeps them fresh. And, but you know what? Never were we on the verge of sinking because there were so many fish in the boat. It just doesn't happen uh, like that. And it happened here at this time for these disciples. And the others that were there with them, they saw this great miracle that took place as well. They were all fishing together. I don't know if you've ever seen these guys out as they're coming in. I mean, they'll go out into the sea, but they're communicating with one another. These fishermen and these other uh, boats and ships, um, they count on each other. They look to each other for help, for good information. And uh, man, these fishermen's boats are here filled with fishes to the place where they begin to sink. Verse number eight, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. Man, Simon Peter right here recognizes who he's with, doesn't he? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Performing this amazing miracle here where Simon Peter falls down before him and gives him the praise that he's due. But you know what Simon Peter recognizes? He's a low down, no good sinner, isn't he? And he's in need of a Savior as well. Verse number 9, For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. Jesus Christ, sharing with this great fisherman here, after probably the most miraculous day or night of fishing he has ever had in his life, he then utters those words, Simon, your new adventures are going to be fishing for men. And they are going to be far greater than what you've just witnessed here and what you've just seen. Verse number 11, And when they had brought their ships to land, for they forsook all and followed him. 
This is Simon Peter. This is James. This is, this is John, the sons of Zebedee. Um, they see this great miracle that has happened here. Jesus Christ has performed before them. Simon Peter fell down on his face before the Lord. And as soon as their ships got there to shore, they said, you know what? We're, we're leaving all of this. We're following the Master. They've recognized that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the only begotten Son of the Father. Verse number 12, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, Behold, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. This man here that uh, has leprosy sees the Son of God coming and has the faith to say, Lord, I know that if you will, you can heal me. It's your choice. You're the creator of this universe. Lord, hear my words, Lord. I know and I believe that Thou art the Son of God. And if You choose to heal me, then You can do just that. Thou canst make me clean. Verse 13, And He put forth His hand and touched Him, saying, I will be Thou clean. This is the Son of God here we're talking about, isn't it? God in the flesh. As this man with leprosy uh, shares his faith in Jesus Christ and says, Lord, if, if Thou will, Thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him. And Jesus Christ utters those words, I will be Thou clean. And he heals this man that has leprosy immediately. The Bible says in the remainder of verse 13, and immediately the leprosy departed from the man. You know, leprosy was one of those diseases that can be seen with the eyes, can it? And leprosy having uh, changed the color of so many people's skin, it's evident when people have leprosy, it's evident when they do not. And it was very clear that this man at one point had leprosy and immediately was made whole again at this moment as he met Jesus Christ. The Bible says immediately the leprosy departed from him and he charged him to tell no man. This is interesting here. Jesus Christ, he heals this man. We talked in Sunday school about Jesus being a God of mercy and gracious and long suffering and and, uh, abundance of uh, of truth. And uh, God is so very good. And he comes and he, he heals this man. He has compassion on this man. And he heals him because of the great faith that he has in trusting that he's God in the flesh. And Jesus Christ heals him and says, don't tell anybody about this. This blessing is for you. I've healed you. Go on your way. Verse 14, once again, and he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. He says, you know what, go ahead and follow uh, the the, uh, Old Testament law here and go seek out the priest and let him confirm that you've been healed of this disease of leprosy. Verse 15, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. This man was told to tell no man, but you know what? There were people there that saw and this man clearly couldn't keep his mouth closed about what Christ had done for him, could he? And his fame uh, grew and, and multitudes came and people came seeking the healing hand of Jesus Christ. Verse number 16, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is there full of power and glory. It doesn't matter that the Bible says the scribes and the Pharisees, the Gentiles. It doesn't matter who it was that would be before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has the power and the authority to heal any of their affirmities, doesn't He? As mankind trusts That Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, so often He does that throughout the Word of God. Verse number 18, And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. 
And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Jesus is looking for men of faith here, isn't he? He's there with this great multitude of people. He's already uh, healed this man with a withered hand and and healed this man of leprosy. And the crowds are coming out and people are are wanting to heal or be uh, healed by Him. They want to hear from Him. And there's such a multitude there that this man that's sick of palsy, man, the people that have brought him, they can't make a way in. You can imagine trying to get yourself through a great crowd. That can be a challenge at times, can't it? Imagine having somebody on a couch and you're trying to carry him through. Excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. And people are there to see the Son of God. Nobody's parting the way for them, are they? But these men have such great faith in knowing that Jesus Christ can heal and they were not going to take no for an answer. They made their way up onto the housetop. They begin to disassemble the tiles that are there. And the other things that are, that are up above so that they can actually lower this couch down in the midst. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in a service there and, and Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, is there teaching uh, mankind and all this racket is happening up above. The roof is being disassembled and all of a sudden a, a couch with a man that is sick of palsy is being lowered down before, before Jesus Christ. Man, that's great faith, isn't it? I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm coming to see Jesus. I've come to meet with him and I'm going to do everything that I can to meet with him and to see him because I know that he can heal me. Verse number 20, and when he saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has the authority and the power to forgive mankind of sins. His very own creation, he could choose to do that, can't he? He's God in the flesh. And he shows up here and he's teaching. And this man is lowered down through the roof here. And Jesus openly says to him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. People heard what he said, didn't they? He's there in the midst teaching. Verse number 21, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, this is a major challenge for these scribes and Pharisees that are mentioned in God's Word here. They can't get their mind around the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. They think He's just another man. And they're, they're uh, inside of themselves. We talked in Sunday school a little bit about righteous indignation. When we see people sinning against God, the Holy Spirit um, can stir up within us and cause us to be upset about the sin and the offensive behaviors of ourselves and others around us. And these Pharisees and these scribes that are here, you know what? I believe they were zealous in their hearts to serve God. And they saw this man named Jesus proclaiming to be God and forgiving mankind of their sins, that could be offensive, couldn't it? But Jesus came here, didn't He, with a very specific purpose. This is God in the flesh that we are talking about here. And these men, these scribes and Pharisees mentioned here, they do not recognize Jesus Christ as God in the flesh at this moment. But they know God can forgive sins, don't they? Verse number 22, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, another clear demonstration of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh, we know that God is all-knowing, isn't He? He He beholds the evil and the good. His eyes are in every place, the Bible says. He can discern the hearts of mankind. We don't have to utter any words or anything, and Jesus knows what's in our hearts and our minds, doesn't He? Because He's God. And he perceives their thoughts. He answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins are, be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. And Jesus knows that they are contemplating and they're going back and forth in their mind that 
How could such a man do this except he be God? I mean, only God can do this. And, and we don't believe this man is God right here. And this is blasphemous in what this guy's doing. But you know what? Can they deny the miraculous things that have occurred here in their presence? Jesus Christ is God. And he demonstrated that by having the apostles, the disciples at this time, launch out their boat and catch all these fishes that are there. And healing this man with, a, with a, a leprosy and this man with a withered hand. And he's now uttered these words that, man, thy, thy sins are forgiven thee. And it's caused a little bit of an uproar, hasn't it? And he begins to reason with these men. And keep in mind, there's a great crowd of people here. The, the, the crowd hasn't dispersed. The man has been let down through the ceiling. And there's a great crowd. Remember, they couldn't even get in because of the, the press that was there. And Jesus Christ asked that question. Um, man, is it easier just to tell them your sins are forgiven or just pick up your bed and walk? I mean, what do you want me to say here? Verse number 24 but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. That's the point Jesus is making here, isn't it? He says, I am here. I am God in the flesh. And I have the power to forgive sins. And you need to understand that. And he's proclaiming that to all those that are here that he's teaching at this time. He has the power to forgive sins. Verse number 24, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. So he does. He says, you know what? Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. He, he, he perceives these things going on within the hearts and minds of, of some that are there, the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'm sure there were others questioning who he really is in being able to do these things. And Jesus goes on to just tell him, arise and take up thy couch and go into thy house. He heals this man, doesn't he? And he's told him his sins are forgiven and he's told him to take up his couch and be on his way. God is so very good. This is Jesus Christ we're talking about here, God in the flesh. This isn't just a man. This is the Son of God. Verse number 25, and immediately he rose up before them and took that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. He says, praise the Lord. Lord, you want me to pick up my bed and go? I'm going to do it. And he wraps up his stuff and goes on praising the Lord for what God had done for him, for what Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, had done for him. And people were watching this, weren't they? Verse number 26, and they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, we have seen strange things today. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, isn't it? And the fear of God came over these people as they saw God in the flesh miraculously healing these different ones that are here. Uh, multiple people He heals. He's teaching and preaching in the way. And He's teaching them about faith. And man, He is healing people. And you know what? He's having conversations with those that don't believe too, isn't He? Right in the middle of all this, He's having those conversations. And you know, if there's one man or woman that has a particular thought, if you have a big enough crowd, there's probably somebody else that's thinking the same thing or, or maybe has the same doubts, right? Same concerns. And Jesus Christ openly speaks to them all here. And He heals this man. He makes it open and says, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Take up thy bed. And this man glorifies Him. And the fear of God came upon all these people as they were amazed. And after these things, he went forth and saw the publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of uh, custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. This is when Jesus Christ is going and gathering those disciples. I don't know if you guys have picked up on this yet or not. Levi is here, this tax collector, and he's there. And you know what? He's got a good living. 
You know how the tax collectors uh, went at this time. You know, a lot of them, they take a, a little for Uncle Sam and a little for me. Some of them took a little for Uncle Sam and a lot for me. But typically the publicans, uh, they, they weren't uh, in want of things. They had their ways of, of gathering extra for themselves. And uh, here Jesus goes by him and simply says, follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. This is the Son of God that just called him to follow him. Verse 29, And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with him. And so uh, Levi decides to, to follow him. This publican, he goes and he, he has a great feast there in his house. And there's lots of other sinners there. Amen? It's not just a house full of a bunch of God's people. There's lots of other sinners in, that are there. Verse 30, But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? You know, there's just something about a pessimistic attitude that causes the blinders to come over the eyes of human beings. When we constantly want to challenge things with a, a mode of defense and a mode of trying to prove something wrong rather than standing there and considering those things that are brought before us. Um, you know, you, we've all dealt with somebody who's been defensive and, and, and it's so easy to defend against our actions and our thoughts. And a lot of times we can really lose our place in understanding that common sense is not prevailing over our argument. But we're so hung up on trying to prove something wrong or prove ourselves right that we lose that perspective. I believe that some of the scribes and Pharisees are, are starting to come to that place where they're really concerned about just proving that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. And they're trying to point out all these things that they think that they can show that these men are not acting in a godly manner and therefore they must not be godly people and namely, Jesus Christ must not be God in the flesh. Why, why are you eating with a bunch of low down, no goods? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ came to sup with you? Amen. I mean, before I came to know Him as Lord and Savior, I was a sinner. Like Paul, the chief of it. Right? We were there, and I'm so glad that Jesus Christ came and was willing to associate Himself with publicans and sinners. Verse 31, Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. The purpose of Jesus Christ coming on the scene was to save sinners and to reconcile mankind back to God. Amen. He's there to call the sinners to repentance. Verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus Christ was there to proclaim the glory of God before them and challenge them with their sinful behavior so they can come to the place and recognize that they're sinners in need of a Savior. And the Savior of mankind is the very one before them proclaiming these things. And His mission was just that, to call sinners to repentance. Those that did not know Him as Lord and Savior, that they might turn from their wicked ways and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Verse 33, and they said unto him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? He's saying, man, your disciples, the people that follow you, boy, they're not fasting or any of these things. We're watching all these other people around us in our religious organizations. And man, they spend lots of time in fasting and in prayers. But, but those that you call disciples that are following you, man, they're not doing the same, are they? This is important here, verse number 34. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Jesus Christ is giving them the words of truth here and saying, you know what, I'm present. I'm on the scene. I'm with them. There's no need for them to fast as I am here. The Son of God, God in the flesh, I am here with them. Verse number 35, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they shall, or then they shall fast in those days. Once Jesus Christ has given His life, amen. 
And he's there reminding them once again that he is God in the flesh. He is there. Verse 36, and he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent. And the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. Boy, we noticed something this morning. I don't know if you guys saw my daughter Ashley walking around here. She's got a denim Levi jacket on. Man, it's got a bunch of holes in it. A bunch of holes in it. And it was made that way on purpose. Look kind of odd. It was a point of conversation this morning as we, we look at such a thing. And Jesus Christ here is making a, a, a similar illustration here. Um, you know what? This is God in the flesh that is proclaiming these things to these people, isn't it? And he's sharing with them that he's here and that he is on the scene. And these things have happened here as we come to this place in Luke chapter number 6. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. They were doing those things that they would do during harvest there in the Old Testament time. And you know what? Harvesting on the Sabbath was against the Sabbath law, wasn't it? And yet the disciples, as they have given up everything to follow Jesus Christ, and they're, they're in need, and they're hungry, and they're going through this cornfield, Jesus Christ does not rebuke them for taking corn and eating, does He? But those that are looking at things from the other side here are looking at them and saying, man, these wicked, evil people, look what they're doing on the Sabbath day. You know, Jesus Christ, I believe, is showing them something here. The Mosaic Law and those things that were instituted in the Old Testament were a foreshadowing of the Son of God to come. And now the Son of God is on the scene, walking in human form, manifested unto us. Verse number 2 of Luke 6, And certain of the Pharisees said unto Him, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Upset. They're upset, aren't they? They're not too happy about what they're watching here. But once again, they're not understanding the things that Jesus Christ is sharing with them. They're not taking into account the miracles and the healings that they have just witnessed with their very own eyes. Because if they would have taken into account these great things that have been done here, they would recognize that this is God in the flesh. It's not like uh, only one, even if it was one miracle that God had done before them, you think they would recognize it. But he's done multiple miracles before them. And the common sense bone that God has given to most of us, boy, it has blinders set over it right here, doesn't it? This group is not happy and they're wanting to just point out those sinful things uh, that are happening and saying, man, these guys cannot be godly people. Verse number three, and Jesus answering them said, have you not read so much as this with uh, what David did when himself was a hungered and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but of the priests alone. Jesus Christ brings up the Mosaic law and those things that God had instituted that the showbread and those things that were in the temple were for Aaron, his sons, and those that were ministering there in the temple. Somebody that was in society just couldn't walk into the temple and start eating the showbread. That wasn't right. But Jesus is reminding them here that there was a need that was fulfilled in allowing David and his men to do just that, wasn't there? And Jesus Christ was fully aware of it and he's bringing this up to these scribes and Pharisees that are here. Verse number 5, And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is bringing this up for a very specific reason, isn't he? He's got a group here, a contingency of people here that are following the Mosaic law and they're having trouble recognizing that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has come to earth to be the final sacrifice for mankind doing away with the Mosaic law that was put into place to show His coming. And Jesus Christ is there now on the scene and He reminds them that He is the Lord also of the Sabbath. This is God in the flesh that is here 
before these people. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath, verse number 6, that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whither he would heal on the Sabbath day, that he might find an accusation against him. Now once again, if we're coming from that attitude of looking for wrong, boy, you don't have to look in people very long to understand they're low down, no good sinners. It happens. People are low down, no good. It's God create, God's creation. He's told us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And yet the Pharisees are here uh, trying to catch Jesus Christ in a, in a place where they can say, boy, you must not be God because you've done such and such. And Jesus just got done saying that He is the Lord of the Sabbath also, didn't He? And so He's there on the first Sabbath, He's there on the second Sabbath, and now we're here in verse 6 where it says it came to pass also on another Sabbath. Do you think Jesus Christ is trying to teach something here? Do you think He's trying to show them something here? Verse number 6, once again, it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. Once again, a demonstration in God's word of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Now where is Christ? He's teaching, isn't he? He's there in the midst of all these people that think they are so religious and and they got all the answers to everything. And Jesus Christ has this man that is withered. He's there in the synagogue and he asks the man to stand up and come out right in the middle of everybody that's there. He's getting ready to do something, isn't he? And this is on yet another Sabbath, the Bible tells us. Verse number 9 of Luke 6, Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? He asked this question as he brings this man that has a withered hand right into the center of all these there in the synagogue. And he asked that question. Is it okay to do anything on the Sabbath? Now, didn't Jesus Christ just say that He was the Lord of the Sabbath as well? He's teaching something here, isn't He? And He asked this rhetorical question about whether it's okay to do good or do evil or save life or destroy life on the Sabbath day. Verse number 10, And looking round about upon them all, He said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. He did this in the middle of the synagogue, in the midst of a great score of people. And as he did these things, he just taught in several different ways about the Sabbath and how he is the God of the Sabbath. And Jesus Christ heals this man in the midst of all of them. And you know what? The the scribes and the Pharisees that were here, they were concerned about who Jesus Christ was, weren't they? But they weren't seeking to see whether the words that He was speaking lined up with Scripture or not, confirming that He is God in the flesh. Because after all, if if you're bent on serving God and studying the Word of God, that is our measuring stick, isn't it? The Word of God. So as we look and we see these things happening, if we compare the words of the preacher, the the evangelist, the one that's proclaiming the words of God, if we compare it to His Word and it lines up, then He must be of God. Amen? This man must be proclaiming the Word of God. You know, I don't hear of Satan and his minions out there getting on this bandwagon that mankind needs to serve the one true and living God. Have you heard a Satanist say that before? We talked about this a little bit. You know, we have a lot of Satanists that are here in L.A., a lot of Satanic churches that are here in Los Angeles. And boy, these Satanists will tell you that their God, Satan, that they serve, He's loving, He's compassionate. They'll even say He's long-suffering. But you know what? He is not the only true and living God, is He? 
And they're not going to proclaim to anybody that they need to worship the only true and living God. They're going to proclaim that they need to worship Satan, claiming that he is God. Because after all, you remember in Isaiah chapter 14, Satan there himself said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High. He thought he was going to be God. Great audacity and pride coming from a created being that he's going to take over. But you know what? A great example of pride, as we can see, even in our societies today, as pride is lived out in the lives of mankind. And some people will do anything to accomplish the goal that they've set before them if pride is on their side. And Jesus Christ here brings this man into the center of all those that are here. He looks round about. He makes this man whole. Verse number 11, And they were filled with madness and communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. At this point here, Luke chapter 6 and verse number 11 From this point forward, the scribes and the Pharisees and many others are bent on taking the life of Jesus Christ. They're not looking for any other answers other than his death to come. That's all they're going after. And it's really sad to see because as we, once again, we go out and try and prove something wrong or we try and do something uh, wrong to God's man, we want to blaspheme him, we want to we talk bad about God's man. I mean, now we're talking God in the flesh here, amen? We're talking about Jesus Christ. They're going to do anything and everything to eliminate him because they do not like his message. They're going to have trouble eliminating the Son of God, aren't they? Because God has put a perfect plan together. He knew the sinfulness of mankind. And in the beginning, as our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit set out in creating this universe, they put together an amazing plan. Knowing that giving their creation free will to make decisions and choose on their own would require a Savior. And the very Son of God said, I'm going to be that Savior. I'm going to be the one to sacrifice my life for all of mankind. And that was the purpose of Jesus Christ coming to this earth. Was so that he can fulfill the Old Testament scripture and the sacrificial system and be the final sacrifice for mankind. You remember as Jesus Christ gave up the ghost on the cross of Calvary there, the last words that he uttered was, it is finished. He paid it all. Our salvation doesn't cost us anything. It's free. All it takes from us is to make a decision and say, Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, the Bible says. We recognize that we're a sinner, just like Levi did. As he, just as, he, as Peter did, as they fell on their faces and said, Lord, I, I believe in who you are. We recognize that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. Man, the things that I'm doing are in opposition to what God wants me to do. And I need a righteous and holy Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. And he offers that free gift of salvation as he spent everything that he had in his death, burial, and resurrection for mankind. He gave his life. The Bible says that all we need to do is believe and trust in Jesus Christ. We must confess to our Heavenly Father that Jesus Christ is his Son. That he is God in the flesh. And that he came here and he paid the ultimate price for the sin of mankind. And he's holding out that free gift of salvation to anyone who is ready to receive it. My death, burial, and resurrection is paid for all of your sin. All you have to do is reach out and accept this. And so as the Bible tells us that we need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He is God in the flesh and that He died upon the cross for our sin as a a substitute um, for our uh, sinful behavior, And that he resurrected after three days. Amen. God in the flesh conquered death. You know, there's a difference in what happened in God's word when men are brought back to life in the New Testament. They're simply restored to that former state of life that they were in. Jesus Christ conquered death and resurrected from the grave, didn't he? The only one in scripture that is given the account that that has happened. And it is by his death, burial, and resurrection that mankind can trust that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh for their salvation. 
for their eternal security. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're hearing this today, whether it's on YouTube or whether you're here today in our our midst, if you have questions about what it is to be saved and what the word of God says that we must do to be saved, I'd be more than happy to show you. Call the church office if you're watching this on YouTube. I'll be more than happy to explain this to you. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and he came to this earth to rescue mankind from an eternity in hell. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you so very much for your goodness to us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to be the final sacrifice for mankind so that we might be reconciled back to you. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody hearing this message today that has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that you would convict their hearts, bring them to that place of understanding that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that very Savior that you've sent to save mankind. We love you, Lord. Bless as we go out throughout the rest of the day. Bring us back safely tonight for our 5 p.m. service, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your attendance. We hope to see you all back at 5 p.m. tonight. We'll be back in the book of Acts.